Welcome to Belfast Film Festival uh, 2020. I'm Lisa Barros de Sa, and I'm so thrilled to welcome today with us one of the world's great actors, uh, celebrated for her work across theatre, television, and film, Oscar nominated, Olivier Award winning, among many other accolades. Uh, I was also fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work with her in Belfast on our film Ordinary Love. Um, and I'm so grateful that she uh, could join us today. Uh, welcome, Leslie Manville. Hello, Lisa. How lovely Hello. to be talking to you. Oh, <laughs> so lovely to be talking to you um, once again. And thank you very much for joining us from Budapest, uh, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, I, yeah, um, it's, uh, I'm filming here. So before anyone goes, oh, what a lovely house Leslie has <laughs> in the background, it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, Leslie, we'll, today we'll sort of chat over um, uh, an overview of your career thus far. Uh, but first of all, can you tell us a bit about the project you're filming in Budapest? And just what, how has 2020 been for you? Well, I mean, I really do count myself as one of the lucky ones. Um, I, 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 re I really do, because so many people in, in our industry, Lisa, are struggling, as we both know. Um, well, it's been, it's been, in terms of work, uh, as I say, I've been incredibly lucky. I was, I was doing a play at the National Theatre called The Visit, a Tony Kushner play, uh, on, the, on the 16th of March when that theatre chose to lock down, which was a week before a national lockdown. Um, and then really my lockdown was primarily punctuated with... Um, the BBC had this idea to, to, to revisit the Alan Bennett Talking Heads monologues, which were originally done about 30 odd years ago. And they thought this would be a good idea because they're monologues and therefore relatively um, straightforward to shoot. So for the first three or four weeks of lockdown, I was learning this 45 minute monologue. It's, it's the one called Bed Among the Lentils that Maggie Smith originally did. So I learned that and then we went to shoot it on the on the uh, EastEnders sets, because obviously they weren't being used, we, we redressed them. So, you know, only an avid EastEnders fan would have spotted that I was actually in Phil Mitchell's kitchen, <laughs> <laughs> uh, being, being a vicar's wife. Um, and then um, Nick Heitner, who produced the series for the BBC, who, who runs the Bridge Theatre in London, thought, well, what a good idea to put them on at the Bridge Theatre, obviously with social distancing in the audience. And again, it was doable because of, um, because of uh, them being monologues. So that took up really most of lockdown. And then as soon as I finished that play, which was only now about five weeks ago, um, I got on a plane and came to Budapest to shoot Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris which is a really delightful film. Um, we're all saying it's like a musical without the music. It's a kind of feel good, gorgeous film set in the 50s about Mrs. Harris, who is a cleaning lady in London and gets this fantastical idea in her head that she wants to own a Dior gown. And she sets off to raise the money to get this dress and come to Paris and get her gown and then all, all, all sorts of things happen to her. So we've been filming very successfully for three weeks now. And, you know, every I'm tested three times a week. The crew are all wearing masks all the time. You know, it's a challenge, but um, with a lot of effort and a lot of patience uh, on everybody's behalf, um, we're doing it. And, you know, everyone's very, very happy and grateful to be back working and earning a living again. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, that's such a cheering story. Not only does it sound like the perfect film to be making and watching uh, in this period of time, but it's, it's, it's just wonderful to, to hear that that part of life can be up and functional again, despite all of the challenges. Uh, yeah, it, and it is happening. Uh, you know, there is a lot of filming happening again, you know, for television and films, because um, it's what people are doing in this time. They're watching... They're watching more television. They're you know, going to Netflix and watching films, any outlets that they've got. So it's got to continue to be made. Otherwise, it'll all, there'll be nothing for anyone to watch. Exactly. If there was ever a time where people should understand the value of the arts, it's this one, right? Yes. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you can say, right, I'm going to do a 
um, Lisa Barrister Sar Glenn Leyburn retrospective and do people's look at people's back catalogues, which is a nice thing to do. Yeah, um, it's quite a short one in that sense. Yours would yours would certainly occupy um, a, 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 a full weekend of magnificent <laughs> work. So that would be something to look forward to. But yes, you could. There are creative ways to to look yeah. at things like that. But everybody wants um, wants new things, and I think it's wonderful to people will love to watch something that's as joyous as your current project sounds like. yeah it, it, it really is it really is a sort of make you feel good film and um and it's very exciting to, that, that we're doing lots of night bit, bits of technical wizardry with cameras and things and so it's it's thrilling yeah it's really enjoyable fantastic lots of dancing i believe dancing i've done i've, I've been waltzing with jason isaacs this week um wearing um a very beautiful um copy of a 1950s Dior gown. Um, and Dior are very, it, it, Dior are very involved with the project, um, but obviously some of their archive of their costumes, you know, we wouldn't really be allowed to bash them around a dance floor now, they'd get ruined. So um, we've had brilliant makers in London who have copied them. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. And next week we shoot um, the fashion show that's 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 in the film, so that's just going to be glorious. And Isabel Huppert arrives at the weekend. Oh. One's quite excited to have this great French dame of, of French cinema arriving to play Madame Colbert, who in our story runs the House of Dior. So it's all exciting. And then oh. there's little me in the middle. <laughs> Who, who wouldn't want to watch these two great actresses together? I mean, God, that would be, that's, that's very exciting, Leslie. Yeah, um, it is. To go back to the early days, Leslie, and just talking about dancing, etc. When you started out, it wasn't going to be acting at all, was it? It was going to be singing. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I did have a very good classical singing voice, and I think it was always the expectation that... I would move into classical music, probably opera, and you know that seemed to be the natural progression, and not a not a delusion either. I mean, I, I really did have a very good voice, but um, you know, I didn't I didn't grow up in a family where we went where we went to the opera. You know, I grew up in a working class family, and my parents were incredibly supportive of of, of the talent that I had. Um, but I, I decided in a completely ill-informed way that opera was boring but I thought well I, I've got this voice so I'll musicals that's what I'll do I'll, I'll, I'll do musicals and won't that be great so um, I mean even then really I, I mean I'm fairly bossy now anyone <laughs> in my family would 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 concur with that but I, I, Leslie not bossy <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> I think they say bossy I sort of decided age 15 that the absolute best thing for me to do would be to leave school <laughs> and, go, and go to a stage school in London. I grew up in Brighton and my parents just said yes. And the great thing was that then you could get a grant to cover it. So I got a 100% grant from Brighton Council, which covered my train fare, which covered the cost of going to Italia Conti. It covered everything. It was brilliant. So I went there for about nine months and yeah, I did singing. I, I learned to dance with Arlene Phillips, the great famous choreographer who taught there. And uh, I'd never really danced before, but my mother was a ballet dancer. So I would kind of inherited that. And I got very interested in acting there. Um, so Arlene asked me to join her new dance group that she was forming called Hot Gossip. Um, and she said, look, it is going to be a bit raunchy. We're going to be on the telly and um, it's going to be sort of, you know, sexy, saucy outfits and things. And I just thought I was I was a very good girl. I, I wasn't anarchic. I didn't break the rules. You know, I was a good, wholesome young lady. And I just thought, mm, I don't know. I don't know if my dad's going to like that, seeing me on telly, scantily clad. <laughs> so, so I declined. Um, and then sort of the acting took off very slowly. I mean, my first job was a musical in the West End directed by John, John Slesinger. I heard this. What, what, was, what was that like as your, first, as your first professional role? Well, I was 16 and he, it, the musical was called Iron Albert and it was about Queen Victoria. 
And there were obviously about five or six central characters and then a kind of um, chorus, if you like, of about 20 people who played all sorts of little parts and sung and danced a bit and all of that. So I was one of them. Um, and I was so naive, so green, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know anything. But there were all these great, wonderful people in it who, who helped me along the way. And, and John Schlesinger was so lovely. And as the years went on after that, I used to bump into him occasionally at social events and he was always so pleased that he'd given me my first job and kind of pleased to see the area that I was going off in and um, that, you know, that it was, all, it was all doing good for me. And then I did Panto, you know, I did Panto in Bradford, Panto in Leeds. I did a stint in Emmerdale Farm when I was 19. Um, which was at the time a twice weekly lunchtime soap. And, but the brilliant thing about it was that all the exteriors were shot on proper film, not outside OB units or video cameras, proper film. So I learned so much about the process of film. I mean, it was, it was weird because then when you'd cut to the studio, it was the most terrible map because of course in the studio you did have multi multi camera video cameras and and it it was a terrible match as you can imagine but you know we had proper rehearsals which they don't have anymore for the soaps um so and i did about i did a i think i did about a nine month stint and then had a little break and then i went back for another three months so uh, it was great and i learned a lot but then I mean, I was kind of from 16 to 22, it'd be true to say that I was kind of drifting around doing anything that came my way. I even did a bit of presenting on a children's television um, show, a bit like Blue Peter, but it wasn't. And then when I was 22, um, I was doing a play at the Royal Shakespeare Company in London. It was a new play, not Shakespeare play. And Mike Lee had been asked to come to the RSC to do a play, but for economic reasons, he had to sort of cast from within the company, within the current company. So very long story short, I was really not a candidate for, for Mike Lee. I, I only ever played myself. I didn't even have a notion in my head about the kind of actress I wanted to be or thought I was. I played myself, end of. And all the parts I'd done up until then sort of reflected that. Um, and then, so anyway, he had me in this play, which for various reasons never saw the light of day in the end. But something between us just absolutely clicked. Uh, we're both very thorough, we're both quite similar people. We want every box ticked. We don't like to leave a stone unturned. And this way of working that he did, which is, I'm sure most people watching this have some awareness of how he works. It's you know very slow process of creating a character, then gradually, gradually building up improvisations that then become the body of the play or the film. Um, and that all takes quite some months to do. Well, he got me playing this character that was a million miles from me. And I absolutely loved it. I loved not having, I mean, you do eventually when you film with him, have a, have a script as it were. You always know what you're saying. You do not improvise on camera, which is a bit of a myth. I think a lot of people just think you roll the camera and see what happens. Nothing could be further from the truth. But I love the fact that the, the means to the end the means of getting to the script was through this improvisation. I loved it, loved it. So I'm 22, 23, sitting there with Mike Lee, and I remember the moment when he said to me, um, uh, you're really very good. You, sh you should really take this very seriously because you can play people that are not like you. And it was the first time anybody had said anything like that to me. And but crucially, I suppose, it hit a nerve with me. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be chameleon. I wanted to play characters that were, were not like me. Um, and I wanted, I knew that I wanted to play 
all of these different people um, and mix it around and not get typecast or locked into a certain character. Now, of course, you know, there are a lot of characters I play that are much closer to me than others, but it's that variety that really gets me up in the morning and gets me wanting to do it. And, and I always love it when people say, God, I didn't realize that was you, or I didn't recognize you in that. And I thought that was somebody else. And then I found out it was you. That really floats my boat a lot. <laughs> How do you, I mean, I think that process that, that you touched on with, with Michael is something that people are really fascinated by. Mm. Um, that, uh, and I can, I can see, hear from what you're saying that, that that felt so liberating. How do you go about, just in a little more detail, how do you go about finding those completely different characters? Does that come from uh, people that you've known in the past? Is that where the conversation starts? Is it, how do you, yeah, that, is that so. build? I mean, it's like writing, isn't it? It's you're almost writing the character together. Is that? Yeah. Well, it is, it, it is with Mike, although, of course, I couldn't write. I mean, I'm absolutely not a writer and I have no desire to write. But give me a couple of months with Mike Lee and, let, and, and we talk and we create this character together. And then this kind of rather um, fearful day comes when he'll put that character into a situation with another character and you've got to actually start speaking and find their voice and thinking about what they say. Except by that point, you know, you're so comfortable with this person you've created that any situation that he puts you in, it all kind of happens very organically. And it's never a case of thinking, oh, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? It kind of just all flows, which is the aim of it all, really. Otherwise, you know, the worst possible kind of improvisations are when you're just thinking, what can I say that's clever? You know, it's not like that at all. But I suppose these characters come from from you know life you you you, you, you know m m when when i work with mike but also when i work with other people um you know he's encouraging you to talk about people that you maybe know quite well or that you don't know very much at all or somebody you might have just seen at the bus stop that morning so i, I think because i worked with him so from when I was very young, um, and although I haven't worked for, for him, with him for a bit now, I've gone on working with him off and on through the decades of my career. And it's instilled in me this, you know, I am an observer and I, I, you do end up looking at life and you put people or bits of people or essences of people in your back pocket and they come out in a way sometimes that you're not even so conscious of. Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess it's that, it's a sort of osmosis thing. Um, but now I think that um, I find it harder to analyze now where it comes from, because I think all of that that I've just said goes on and it becomes the kind of blueprint and it becomes ingrained in me and then so much of it is instinct. You know, when I think about the work we did on Ordinary Love, I mean, obviously you and Glenn, um, that you can set the stage well or you can set the stage badly. You, you both set such a great stage for Liam and I, who are very similar, I think, as actors, to just kind of fly. Um, and so many of those scenes, especially the difficult ones, the, the, the ones where, where, where you're really taking those two characters to a, to a place that they're not that familiar with. I mean, I'm thinking about the time, the only scene where you see them arguing. That's not familiar territory for those two characters. They don't go there that often. So, so much of how we played that for both of us was, was instinct and you, it would be wrong to kind of really work it all out beforehand. You know, say, well, on this line, I'm gonna this and that. You've got to just, it, you, you've got to have, I mean, obviously you and Glenn were so brilliant with us both. And Liam, you know, it wasn't a lot of heavy discussions over lunch. How are we gonna play this scene? You know, how are we gonna really look clever and brilliant? And you just, you, you just, at some point, 
something has to kick in that is not definable, that is not that is beyond analysis. And it is instinct, decades of doing it. And as Mike Lee always says to me, it's a bit of good acting at the end of the day. <laughs> Because that's the job, that's what we do. Let's not forget, that is my job, you know, and I watch actors and I'm with other actors all the time and you just, you watch and you think, yeah, that's, that's, I don't want to, I don't want you to tell me how you've done that. That's just a bit of good acting. Well, let's watch a little bit of good acting now, Leslie. Um, this <laughs> is one of your, this, uh, Mike Lee's Secrets and Lies. This is, um, oh. What you, you've worked with Mike Lee on many films and been, you know, th this is one in which it was a smaller part, but I think this is one of the really iconic scenes from your, uh, you know, from all of your work with Mike Lee. And I think it's one that everyone will remember if we could have a look at that now. Chris himself, you've been hanging on about it for years, but there you go. Have a seat, make yourself at home. Now, before we go any further, have you got any ID? Passport, driving licence? Yeah. You have to get used to all this red tape. Would you like a Rolo? No, thank you. You sure? Yeah. There you go. Hmm. Have a shifty. That's great, all tense now. Thank you. You on your lunch break? Yeah, an extended one. <laughs> have you had any lunch? No, not yet. No, me neither. So what do you do? I'm an optometrist. Oh, really? Oh, God. <laughs> it's one of those things you keep putting off and putting off, isn't it? And I've got to the stage now with the Guardian crossword where I'm, I'm going like this, so I think the time has come. Don't you? I'll have to pop in. You can give me a test. Where do you live? Kilburn. Right, right. In a flat? Yes. You share? No, I live on my own. All oh, right. I lived on my own for about six years before I was married. It's all right, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right, all tense. Let's talk a little bit about you, shall we? Now, obviously, you've been giving a great deal of thought to things and you've come to a decision which is good. But for me, the question is, why now? I just feel that it's the right time, that's all. Right, right. You thinking about getting married? No. Do you have children? No. You thinking about having children? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's fair enough. Are you sharing this with your parents? Do they know that you're here today? I mean, how do they feel about it? They're both dead, actually. All right. Yeah. Mum died two months ago now. Oh, that is recent. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Was it sudden? Yeah. Perhaps that's what's made you start on this. I don't know. It's possible. Well, I'm not trying to replace her. <laughs> She's irreplaceable. Well, they both are. No, of course. Of course. And when you were growing up, was it was it a happy environment? Yes, very. Oh, good, good. And did you, um, were you able to discuss the fact that you'd been... No, it was never really an issue. Right, right. So you've only just found out? Oh, no. They told me when I was little. Oh, good, good. And do you remember how you felt about that? Well, it's not exactly something you forget, is it? No, no. <laughs> I'm sure it isn't. So how did you feel? Well, we all just got on with it as a family, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Perhaps you should have discussed it. My parents loved me and that was all that matters. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, now that we've got you here, what are your expectations? Basically, I just want to know. Yeah, yeah, of course you do. Let me share something with you, Hortense. Somewhere out there, and we don't know where, is your birth mother. Now, she's probably married, perhaps not. She may have other children. She might be dead. She may even be in Australia or somewhere. We just don't know. But what we do know is that at the time she gave you up for adoption, she was under the impression that she would probably never see you again. Now, as I know you're very well aware, the law has changed since then, and you are now legally entitled to seek your birth mother out. But the snag is, she may not want to see you. So I don't want you to raise your hopes too high at this stage. Sure. OK. Have a look at this. What is it? 
it's all about you. That's that incredible um, scene from Secrets and Lies, Leslie. Um, now, I read this recently. Uh, that, you weren't, that wasn't going to be you initially, is that right? No, that's right. And um, uh, no, I was never meant to be in the film at all. Um, and uh, Mike sort of goes undercover, un undercover, underground a bit when he makes a film. And that's the undercover um, idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, he, he, he called me when he was, I knew he was in the middle of editing. And I, 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 I remember picking up the phone, I'm going, what's the matter, are you all right? <laughs> Is everything okay? And because uh, I thought he doesn't usually, you know, make calls that he's kind of so, you know, tunnel visioned about things. So I said, um, he said, look, we've shot this scene. Um, he said, it's a crucial scene in the film. It's pivotal scene. It's a pivotal scene for Marianne Jean-Baptiste's character. Um, and he said, it isn't right. He said, and I've got the money to do a reshoot. Um, he'd actually shot it with um, a, 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 a male actor playing the role. Um, he said, it isn't right, so we want to, I want to do it again. Um, so it was a kind of unusual situation because obviously the character had to be a social worker who dealt with adoption. Um, and uh, so th there was a brief that was kind of far more thorough than when I normally work with him because there's no brief normally. You just... You have to pledge your time and that's it. Um, anyway, so we had three weeks to do it, which sounds a lot, but the first week I spent with Mike talking about people that I knew not connected to the industry who might be a character source for this, this woman. So we spent the first week doing that. Then uh, Mike had a holiday book. So he went off on holiday and I spent the second week um, I got sent off to actually spend time and shadow people who worked in adoption um, in the social services. So that was great. It was a research week, terrific. And then the third week I spent with, with Marianne and we were improvising it and structuring the scene. And, you know, the thing about Mike is when you, when you work the scenes out, you do many, many, many master improvisations that can last a very long time. And eventually out of that, you know, he distills it and he'll say, don't talk about that when you come in, talk about that and then swap that over and talk about the cup of tea later and all of that. So it gets, because obviously at the end of the day, you can't have long rambling, improvised, repetitive scenes. It's got to have a dramatic narrative and serve the film. So um, that's his antennae doing that all the time. You know, my job is to just be, the, be in character and... Um, speak, you know, say it all, come up with all this stuff. So um, that's what we did. And then it all got distilled. And, and once you shoot it, you absolutely know what you're saying. And then I think we just shot it over a couple of days. But it's never been any question for me ever when he's, you know, he has a, he, he has a repertoire of actors that he has worked with repeatedly. He always works with new people as well on every project that he does. Um, and, you know, his, his, his kind of stable of actors, the familiar actors, if you like, we do go in and do big parts in some and small parts in another. You know, in Vera Drake, I play a small part. And obviously Imelda Staunton is the lead. And then in another year, I'm a more central character and Imelda comes in and does a supporting role. Because the work is so rich. It's, you know that you're going to be taken somewhere that you've not been before in terms of a character. I mean, obviously, for economic reasons, he may be making a film and it takes nine months, you know, four of which are shooting and five of which are the preparation and creating. And you can't book everybody for all that time. It just wouldn't be cost effective. So, you know, he knows who his main players are going to be. Um, so he can say to you, right, you're going to be booked for a month or two months or whatever. Uh, and then you go from there. But I've, I've, I, it, it's been really the backbone of my filming career. And of course, we did do about six or no, seven or eight years ago now, we did a play together at the National Theatre called Grief. Um, so, uh, so that was amazing to do a play with him. 
And I also did a radio play with him many moons ago. I think 1979, we did a radio play. And we, we, made, we did this play and nobody could believe that it was absolutely like making a film except all we had was sound, not cameras. We were in costume, we did it on location, absolutely like making a film minus cameras. And it got banned. It got banned by the BBC for 14 years. No. And was eventually aired um, because it dealt with this young girl, I was young in 1979, um, <laughs> who has driving lessons and um, loses her virginity <laughs> to her driving instructor. And we, we recorded this incredibly realistic scene. I mean, I hasten to add, I was not really having sex, let's just be clear. But we were, we were going some way to doing this very realistic radio play. And of course it sounds unbelievably real. So the BBC went, no, 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 can't possibly put that out on Radio 3. <laughs> but they did, but 14 years later. 14 years. So I've kind, of, I've kind of done everything with him really. Um, so, yeah, he's been the backbone of, of my career, certainly. And it's extraordinary work. I think maybe now we should it'd be a good time to have a look at uh, Another Year, which is one of the, I mean, I think probably my favourite role of yours from Mike Lee. The, just the texture of the character that you play there is quite extraordinary. Let's have a look at Another Year. I mean, that, that was quick, Tom. Didn't you get the manure? Gone bust. Here's Joe. Hi, Mary. Hello, Joe. What a surprise. You're all right. I'm great. How are you? Oh, continental. <laughs> it's all sweaty. I've been riding all morning. Have you? I like your hat. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, that's right. Never forget to kiss your mum. I never do. <laughs> no, you're a good boy, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I remember when you were this big, you were a naughty boy. I still am from time to time. Oh, really? I like your coat. Oh, thank you. I think I'm a bit overdressed for a Sunday morning. What do you think? Is that what you wore in bed? Slept in your bed, actually. Is that all right? As long as you clean the sheets. Oh, I didn't actually. Is that a problem? I'll have to wait and see, won't we? Oh, right. oh sorry, Tom. I'm in <laughs> your way. <laughs> all these strong men. Look at his muscles. That's why we had him. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, uh, I'm off then. No one to lift at the stage. Oh, no, it's all right. You sure? Yeah, I'll be fine. I could do the walk. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about, you know. It's okay. Well, it's good to see you. Oh, thank you, Tom. Are you all right? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Had a bit of a wild night, Joe. <laughs> well, I'd best be off. It's, that's such a moving scene. I mean, this character of Mary is just, she just felt to me when I saw her for the first time so much more real than so many characters that one sees played. Just that, the, the that you feel the discomfort of being in her skin, her loneliness, that vulnerability, that affection that she has that somehow ends up tripping her up. Just the, 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 the sheer, the, the feeling of the chaotic energy that she contains. I just thought she was such a wonderful character and that's such a lovely moment where she just plays out her, her needs in this, in this, in this beautiful way. Um, do, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, well, the, 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 yes, I mean, obviously, she's, she's a very complex character and uh, um, lots of people said to me after seeing the film that they all felt that they'd been Mary at some point in their life. Um, but unfortunately for Mary, Mary was, <laughs> Mary was like it most of the time and there didn't seem to be any relief. And obviously what happens in Mary's future, we'll never know. Um, but I remember shooting that scene when um, she's leaving Tom and Jerry's house and it's, it's a Sunday and uh, it, there was, there's, a, there's, one, there's one look when she's, um, she's got drunk the night before with them and she stayed the night and um, she's going back on a Sunday on the on, from Walthamstow, which is where we said they live, right across to the west, west of London. But it, there's a look of, um, she says goodbye and she's looking at the three of them. There's Tom and Jerry and there's, there's um, their son, who, she's, who she 
fancies who she thinks she actually realistically thinks she could have a relationship with and there's a moment when she looks behind her at the road the long pavement behind her that she's got to walk up to the to the tube to the underground to get home and I remember Mike talking about that look uh, I mean obviously it was born out of an improvisation of the scene that we did um, Again, you know, it's not something that you work out. You don't, you know, I'm not thinking the night before, oh, I'll look up the street because she doesn't want to walk up. It kind of all happens organically. And I looked up that street and he, he comes around with the camera and you see her face looking at this road. And the, in that instant, you see the pain and the loneliness that she just simply does not want to walk away from these people because the rest of her day, is isolation, loneliness, um, probably not much to eat, and a night of, of lonely drinking, um, and then back to work the next day. But it, it almost breaks my heart watching that scene. It kind of breaks my heart thinking about Mary even, because it, it, in a way it's, a, it's something very, it becomes very separate from you because it, it is, she was this sad person that I created. Um, and, but I do somehow, when I watch it, I, I'm quite objective about it. Mm -hmm. that, that probably seems strange, but, but I am. Um, but that's what but, I, yeah. I, I think is so interesting about the way you work, Leslie, and that, you know, you're, you have this ability to disappear into these characters that you create and build. But at the same time, you're not lost in there. It's not, it doesn't feel like a, a, you know, a danger to you to get sucked into that world to the detriment of your kind of normal contentment no, and happiness. No. You're, you're always very able to uh, place Leslie somewhere quite accessible outside of that. Um, and is that something that's a, a, a product, do you think that, is that just your style or is that something that developed through your work with Mike, for example? I think it, I think there's no doubt about it. It's come it's come through the work with Mike, and and you know I hasten to add that it sounds like he's the only person I've ever worked with. But you know, there've been there've been there've been periods when I haven't worked with him for ten oh, years. You know, but sure. so it's been off and on over the decades. But yes, I mean because I think because I worked with him a lot in my twenties mm. and thirties. Uh, it was very formative, and you see the thing about working with him is that you do create these characters over a very long time and you really, really get into these characters. But the discipline with him, because you then have to stop the improvisation, come out of character, and then one-to-one -one with him, decode it, debrief it, discuss. Mm. You've always got your own antennae on the go. You have to. Even when you're in the middle of an improvisation, you have got to have your own antennae monitoring what you're doing because you're going to dissect it with him later. So that thing of going in and out of character is, became very normal for me. But listen, whatever gets you through the night as an actor, whatever you choose to yeah. do, is, is up to you, but I'm, I don't. I mean, I, 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 I've done very difficult plays, Ghosts, Long Day's Journey Into yeah. Night, Grief, the play I did with my difficult plays, sad plays, um, drug addicts, um, lonely people, people who, are, who, are, who, who are, are pent up and can't say what they feel but I never take it home with me. I, I come off and it's done and it's gone. And, you know, um, it, with, an, with ordinary love as well, that was really important that, that, I, that I let that go at the end of the day. Yes, we, had, we were making a film that had some quite tough subject matter, but there was such a joy, joyous feeling on set when we were making it. And I mm. think that you and Liam and the way that you were able to just, the generosity, I think, between you as actors, and not just toward one another, but also toward the crew, uh, I think that created a lovely 
just a lovely sense that everyone could feel positive about, about what we were doing. And you were both just, um, you know, marvelously able to then find those moments of big emotion quite, you know, it seems effortless. It's the lifetime of brilliant experience that you've had and talent. Um, but you know, but, it, but it's places. important to me all of that because you know yeah. you're not just making a film in isolation. Sure. You know, I'm just there to serve Leslie Manville. I, 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 it, a good film will only end up being a good film. It, 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 there's so many ingredients, so many, and you want everybody to have a good day. You want everybody to go home thinking, "I did my best today." Whether it's whether it's the DOP, the director, the actor, or the runner, you know, you want everyone to feel that they're working towards something that is going to be good, um, and 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 everybody to feel that they're fulfilling their part it, to the best of their abilities. Now, that's not to say you don't have frustrating days, and you don't have days sometimes when, you know, some people might make you a bit irritated, but you want. Uh, you, you want there to be a good atmosphere on set. That's when the work can, you know, get everyone does their best work. Amen to that. I think that's really important. And that's certainly always the, the way, the way that um, we've always wanted to work. I think that you've got to be a human being first and you're never going to, you're, you're never going to get the best out of anyone if you create an atmosphere that makes them feel no. frightened about, about being there or, or are anxious about being there. No, indeed. Um, so, I'd love to talk more about your theatre work. I, I, we obviously don't have all day to do that, but I just wanted to, to, <laughs> to mention, <laughs> because yeah, I mean, there's a lot. You've, you've had this brilliant and varied career, and I know that theatre was, you know, is, is always going to be one of your great loves. I d wouldn't want to put it in competition with the other, with the other forms. But um, and you had you you did a lot at the same time as you were doing a lot of early work with Mike Lee. I think you were working at the Royal Court with Carol mm. Churchill. Yeah. Um, how was that important to your development as an actor? Well, I mean, I mean, looking back on it, it really was just halcyon days. It was quite an extraordinary time. Um, and I think I was kind of aware of that when I was in it, but I'm even more aware of it now because I think when I look at my 20s and 30s and I look now at 20 and 30 year old actors who are just starting and just coming up, I would not want to be doing that now at all. Mm. I think there's so much pressure on them to be famous, um, especially if they're good looking. Mm. Uh, they can be a brilliant actor if they're good looking. You know, agents want them to America this and that and face and media and all of that. And the real point of it all, the work and getting better as an actor can get forgotten. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think that I'm, uh, there are exceptional young actors and goodness me, I've worked with a few of them, exceptional, and they've really got their heads screwed on. They know about, they know that yes, making brilliant films and doing brilliant television, if you're, if you're collaborating with a good team is rich and wonderful, but they also know that there's something about the discipline of theatre and the, the, um, the solitary performance uh, level of theatre, not that you're not working with other actors on stage, but the performance is about you and you've got to sustain that. It isn't two minutes and then cut and, let's, and then piecing together, I mean, which is challenging as well pitching a film performance so that when all the bits are put together again it makes a, a coherent whole. Theatre, you've got to walk on that stage, the arc of the evening is you and the other actors, it's your responsibility, nobody's going to stop you, nobody can cut away from you if you're not acting very well, uh, it, it, there's nowhere to hide and it is the most brilliant thing to achieve and it will only infuse and uh, um, bolster the work that you do on film and television. But there's far less theatres in, in the provinces now than there used to be. I mean, it was very normal when I was in my 20s and 30s to go off anywhere and do plays, just go somewhere to do play after play after play. 
you know, way back in the day before I was born, people did tw a two weekly rep, which meant every two weeks they were putting on a new play and learning it. And it could be Shakespeare with masses of stuff to learn. But my God, it's, it teaches you a hell of a lot. And yeah, I was working at the Royal Court with Carol Churchill, with a brilliant director, Max Stafford Clark. Um, I was working with Sam Mendes on The Cherry Orchard, Edward Bond on The Pope's Wedding and Saved, um, Danny Boyle directed Saved. Um, I worked with Roger Michel. So lots of these directors who've gone on to be, you know, formidable film directors. Um, they all understand the value of, of theatre and what it teaches them as directors, because it's much more performance focused. Mm. You know, when you're making films, of course it has to be performance focused, but a director has so many other things to think about as well. Whereas in the theatre, it's, it's, it is weighed much more heavily on, on getting the performance right. Um, but I'll, you know, I, I, I love, I love the mixture in my career now. I love it. I mean, it is a bit more film and television heavy the, lately, but, um, you know, I st I, it, it was still only two years ago that I did Long Day's Journey in Tonight, and it was only earlier this year that I was doing the visit at the National Theatre. So, you know, every every year or every two years, I'd, I, I would miss it if I didn't do one. I want to skip forward a little bit to one of those more recent film projects, which I think has been one of your uh, one of your most iconic ones of recent years, which was playing Cyril in um, Paul Thomas Anderson's The Phantom Thread. And I think we'll play a little clip of that now. Would you like me to ask Alma to leave? No, why? Well, if you're going to make her a ghost, go ahead and do it, but please don't let her sit around waiting for you. I'm very fond of her. Oh, you're very fond of her, are you? <clears throat> well, in that case... No, don't turn it on me. I don't want your cloud on oh, my shut head. shut up, I mean, You can shut right up. Don't pick a fight with me. You certainly won't come out alive. I'll go right through you and it'll be you who ends up on the floor. Understood? Cyril became Cyril was such a precise character. I mean, it, right, you know, that the, the precision of Cyril's character is almost sewn into the clothes that she's wearing. I mean, I'd love, <laughs> I'd love you to talk about a little bit about how you developed that character um, alongside the great Daniel Day-Lewis's character. That sibling relationship is just, it's so potent within that film. Yes, well, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 just the thing that your, your life can change, uh, 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 your, your life can turn on a sixpence just like that, for the bad and for the good. There was a, a day in um, 2016, and my agent called me and said, um, Paul Thomas Anderson wants to talk to you tomorrow about a film. Obviously I knew his work <laughs> really well. I didn't know him at all, but I knew his work very well. And um, she said, he doesn't want a conference call. He just wants to speak to you and he's going to phone you tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. So I said, great, that's good. And I, and I thought, yeah, he's, he won't call. He'll, he'll forget or it'll be, he'll, he'll call me at midday and, you know, on the, on the nose of 11 o'clock calls. And that already tells you a lot. Well, yeah. it does me anyway. It does. Um, and we, it was like, Instantly, I'd known him all my life. It was just great. It wasn't scary talking to him. It just felt like how I felt when I met you and Glenn. It just felt easy and great and everyone on the same page, you know. So he said, <laughs> he said, I'm going to send you this script. He said, it'll come by FedEx because I don't trust emails. And um, he said, have a read and let me know what you think. <laughs> I thought, I can probably tell you now, Paul, what I think. <laughs> let's, go, let's go through the boring routine of having to send it to me. <laughs> so 
So, of course, um, yeah, it was a complete no-brainer. But this was about seven or eight months before the film was going to be made. So I knew I was going to be doing it for a very long time. But he said, you know, in a couple of months, I'm going to be coming over to London with Daniel. So let's all have a night out. And um, well, of course, it was one of the great nights out. <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, from that, Daniel and I struck up a friendship and it, it, it went on from there. And we became friends, you know, Leslie and Daniel became friends. And there was a lot of humour and a lot of humour between Paul and I. And um, over the seven months, that just kind of grew. And then, but Paul was not very, uh, he, he wasn't prescriptive about Cyril, about how she must be. He wasn't, he kind of just, he just let me, he let me sit on this script, this character, let me kind of let, the osmosis do its thing and obviously I was researching the period and the clothes I had endless costume fittings with brilliant Mark Bridges um, and then you know as things were getting closer that there came a time when Daniel likes to slip into being the character being Reynolds which is absolutely fine by me um, and when we got on set the first day, you know, I very, I very quickly learned how Paul likes to work. And still, you know, he was very, okay, let's just, let's just do this scene and see, see what, see what happens. And that's what, that's key to what he does, which is a great testament to his actors. He just lets you do it, and then he sees little seeds of things that you're doing. Like I remember one day with the glass, Cyril's famous glasses, um, I took them off one day in the scene and, and I went like that and tidied the hair. And he absolutely loved that. And so through all of, through all of that, I kind of, very quickly, I mean, obviously you've got to get the character together on day one, there's no point shooting for a whole day and then but there is that feeling of you, you're, you're, you're just finding your feet. Anyway, the first scene that we did shoot, in fact, was we shot everything in the Cotswolds, their country home. And we shot the scene when Cyril comes to the country. It's quite early on in the film. And Reynolds has been there the night before and he's met Alma and he's taken her up to the atelier and he's sort of fitting, measuring her and and then Cyril arrives. That was the first scene we shot. So we shot it for three days. I mean, it, on the page, it's, it's a page. It's not a lot of dialogue, but we shot for three days. Wow. <clears throat> and so then on about the fourth or fifth day, I said to Paul, it's really annoying, you know, just finding your feet and everything. I just wish we could reshoot those, that first scene. And he said, oh no, it's fine. We're gonna reshoot that. He said, <laughs> he said, you know, I wasn't happy with the lighting. I wasn't happy with the dress we were fitting on Alma. Uh, he wasn't happy with the clothes that, that, out that Cyril was wearing. And he was right. It was all a bit, we, we'd got her London look, absolutely. We knew that she wore these neat little grey dresses in the atelier. And that we knew that when she went out, she had these fabulous little suits. And it was all nip, nip, nip and cute and not cute, but you know, precise. Hmm. But we hadn't quite got the country look. So we'd gone a bit tweedy and it just looked a bit frumpy. Hmm. And actually, although Cyril's sexuality is never discussed, it's quite ambiguous and nobody knows about Cyril's <laughs> sex life past, present. So we, but we could she's, thought, sexy. she's got a sexiness, the character for sure. She has, she has got a, she has got a kind of tightly bound up sexuality mm. about her. But we knew this tweed was just not working. So all in all, we reshot this scene. So it's through all of those things that she starts to emerge, and there's no question about it. We, yes, we got that costume wrong, but then we got it absolutely right. Mm. But 
all the fittings that I'd had had mostly been about her London look. So that kind of feel of her being very, she was not waffly. She didn't, she didn't, she knew what she wanted to say and she said it very precisely. And of course, Daniel and I had, been, had become very close as Leslie and Daniel. And in some kind of way, I think what we did was we just, you know, when he became Reynolds, which happened about a month or so before shooting began, um, and I was inching towards Cyril, we kind of took that intimacy that we developed and we just transferred it to how that would be for Cyril and Reynolds. I mean, obviously very different, but this very dependent relationship, sibling relationship, you know, their whole lives they've spent together. You know, he gets her to deal with his relationships, to clear up the mess. She gets out her little neat dustpan and brush and dispenses with the women. And then, bring, and then the new one, it's a kind of, but we understood it. it. Again, it didn't need to be analyzed. Daniel and I just knew how to do these two people. And Paul is a phenomenal director, but, but he, 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 does, he does in a way what you and Glenn did. You allowed Liam and I to to do our thing and then you'd come in and, and then we'd dissect, dissect it and refine it and modify it. You'd throw in thoughts and ideas. That's what Paul would do. He'd come in and he'd say, yeah, that's great, that's great. But why, what if she this as well? And, do you, and what if, maybe she's gonna, would she that? And then, I, and then I'm going like that. So it becomes the best. I don't want to work on my own. Hmm. I, I, so, but having said that Paul left me alone, he kind of left me alone at the right time, I think. He let, he let, he let me start to simmer away with Cyril. But I, you know, a, lot of, a lot of television work I do, I think that there are a lot of directors that fall into a category and they just think, oh, well, isn't that great? We've got so-and-so to play this role. Well, they'll just come in with something amazing. Well, yes, hopefully, but that, I don't want to sit at home on my own working it out. I want to collaborate. I want to be directed. I want to be. I, I can't do it. On, I can't do it on my own. No, and I'm talking about just some great, some of the great TV work you've been doing recently. I think that's really, uh, you know, a, a program like Mum, for example, is a real case in point. There's such a specific tone about Mum, and it's glorious. I mean, you can't even call it a sitcom. It needs to have a different term, I yeah, think. I hasten to add, sorry, just before you go on, Lisa, I hasten to add, we had brilliant directors on Mum, brilliant. We had Richard Laxton for the first series, and then Stefan Goloszewski, who writes it, he directed series two and three. Anyway. What's lovely about that, you know, you've got quite some beautiful sort of really, uh, you know, very comedic um, stuff in there, but you've also got this great poignancy and it's all managed by the, the by just by the idea that we're seeing this world through Kathy's eyes and yes. everything seems to flow from there. And um, it's a brilliant uh, piece of television. And, yes. you know, we're very much praised for being so. I think if, if anyone hasn't seen that, they absolutely should. Um, so bringing you back to another uh, another of your great um, pairings on screen is if we made Ordinary Love together, Leslie, in, uh, it seems like a different world now that we made it in, but it was here in no. Belfast, not, not very long ago, really, and um, we had the glorious experience of working with you and uh, Liam Neeson, which is just the greatest gift as a director to have that opportunity, and um, but can you just tell us what it was like working with Liam? Well, listen, before I get on to Liam, I mean, it was a gift. The whole job was a gift. And, and I, you know, you, 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 go, you go into projects and you, 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 you can, you, I didn't know Liam. I didn't really know you and Glenn, but you kind of thought, oh, you know, it all seems good. I know we'd met up in New York and we'd, because I was filming, um, doing the play there and Liam lives there. And so you and Glenn came over so we could do a bit of work before arriving in Belfast. But I mean, I just, 
I, we were there, I was there for about six weeks. We shot it quite quickly. And, um, and I always remember thinking before I went, oh, well, it's only Belfast. I'll nip home to London at the weekends. You know, we do five day weeks, I'll nip home. And, and I didn't go home once. I, and that's a testament really to the whole experience, but primarily the filming experience. I was just loving it so much. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't frightened at all of working with Liam because you could think, well, he's a big movie star. And the first time I met him, he, he walked into my dressing room at BAM in Brooklyn, New York, and he'd been to see Long Day's Journey in Tonight. And he walked into the dressing room and he gave me a big hug. And I, I just immediately adored him um, and thought, I'm probably going to spend half of Ordinary Love standing on a box because there's quite a big height discrepancy. We didn't do it too often in the end, did we? I think there was just one day of a box, the rest of the time. There was only one little box. One box. Yeah. Um, and, and then we went out for dinner in New York and then you and Glenn came over and we did, we did so well. And I just thought, well, this is easy, you know, because you can, you can kind of, very easy to do with Liam, because of course, apart from all his amazing work on stage, you know, he's, he's, he's a movie star. And you can, you can build these people up to being something that the other bit of me sees, you know, which I suppose happened with Daniel Day-Lewis as well. You think, well, these people are kind of iconic and, but, you know, but both those actors, they're just so normal and they really are just normal. Um, so it, 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 you know, it's not a, it's not a problem. And I, I, I remember that first day of filming, we were shooting in, um, um their house weren't we it was um uh, yes. Tom Tom. And Joan's house and uh, yeah, thank, we... you. thank you for reminding me she was called Joan God. yes the first scene yeah. we shot was, was we had three or four days didn't we in their in their house and the first scene and was the one where you two have to I mean I felt dreadful about it at the time but you know <laughs> We had to, we put you in a, it was just like, yeah, and we had, we, we had spent a, a, as much time together as we humanly could, but it wasn't very much. And, uh, okay. and you know, so we sat you down and said, yes, okay, just, it's a 30 year marriage, you know. It's a no for a guy. Marriage. It's been quite early on in the film, isn't it? When they're yeah. lying on, he's lying on the sofa, they're watching the telly and they're talking about the Fitbit. Yes. And just that was the first scene we shot and, um, but I mean, where could you plow in? Every scene is about uh, them in a 30 year marriage. So it was as good a place to start as any, but I remember thinking, right, you know, um, slate one, take one. And you kind of think, right, 30 years of marriage with Liam Neeson and action. <laughs> but again, you know, it, it, it's acting, isn't it? It's acting. You've got to just act it. Yes. Um, and so you did quite quite brilliantly and uh yeah i mean it was it was so great and you know testament to you guys we were not in a in a paul thomas anderson situation you know we were not going to be able to reach no out. no i mean i was very jealous when i heard that story <laughs> i know 14 we had on um on phantom thread and the producer at the end of it said to me well you know it's normal with paul but we probably we probably haven't used about three weeks worth of it um so but but that's that's the that's the way he he rolls. And that, but he's yeah he's lucky because he's got he's he's lucky. He's I've earned got, yeah. it though. He's earned it. He certainly has. He's he's, he's made, made a few. Good films. He's, made, he's made a couple of good movies. Yeah, that's true. He's <laughs> all right, you know. And, and and I have to say, in case anybody thinks what a great filmmaker he is, or maybe he is a, such a delightfully gorgeous man as well. He's a proper proper human being. So that I always think that's um. Um, it really important for people to know. I agree, and I, honestly, I think that's where the great work comes from, right? If yeah, want, of yeah. course. And nobody wants to work with difficult RC people. Just really know. Yeah, that's a great myth that some people, some people have played on. I think over the years, but it's not true. Mm. Yeah, not. yeah. So uh, we could talk forever about you've got so there's so many brilliant films and productions that we haven't had the chance to talk about, but. Um, You've got to uh, get back to um, get back to Budapest. I would just like to ask you: 
two things I would like to ask you. One of them is a question that my daughter Sylvie has contributed. And I love Sylvie, as you know. Uh, I do, and <laughs> thank you very much. She would be delighted to know, Leslie. I think, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a question I think that a lot of people would like to, like to know the answer to. What, Ooh, I mean, um, <laughs> what, Leslie, what is the favorite film that you have worked on over the years? There can't, there isn't, there can't be. It, there, there just isn't. I mean, I can tell you the ones that are up there. Okay, go on, uh, that'll do nicely. Yeah, well, Another Year is up there. Um, Phantom Thread is up there. And Ordinary Love is up there. And also for sheer, the sheer th enjoyment of playing um, a, 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 the boldness of a director, Tom, Tom Bazooka, who directed a film that comes out later this year. And I'm not just saying this because this film comes out later in the year and I want people to see it. it. It's called Let Him Go. But Tom Bazooka, an American director making an American film with Kevin Costner and Diane Lane, asked me to come and play this really, really bad, bad, bad mama with a peroxide blonde wig from North Dakota who wields a gun. I mean, top marks to him for thinking, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Leslie Manfield to play this. So that film, for sheer um, joy of, of a director pushing the boat out and not having any blinkered vision, and the film's great as well. So this character, Blanche, who I play in that, has, has, is up there as well. Oh, I can't wait to see that. I mean, he knows. He knows what we all know, that you can do anything, Leslie. <laughs> um, absolutely. And I think a lot of people are going to be excited to know that uh, you have been cast as Princess Margaret in The Crown, which is going to yes, be... Yes, I have. I have. Your, um, your pal, uh, Imelda Staunton. Yes. <laughs> the last time Imelda and I worked together, we were pixies in Maleficent. <laughs> So I can see why they want us to play the Queen and Princess Margaret. They've only got to watch Maleficent to see that it's glaringly obvious. <laughs> um, but no, I'm really looking forward to that. I mean, that's not till um, next year, obviously. Um, uh, and the, the, another fascin fascinating woman to get my chops around. Um, so I shall enjoy that hugely. In a very, playing her in a very, you know, the last two decades of her life were quite lonely and um, very latterly peppered with illness and um, some level of disability really. But yeah, fascinating character to play. And, you know, I'm, I'm stepping into the shoes of two great actresses, Vanessa Kirby and Helena Bonham Carter, who've certainly sown pretty good seeds. So yeah, but it'll be really exciting. and. And you know this film I'm doing now, Mrs. Harris goes to Paris. It's it's all it's all joyous, and I don't take it for granted for a single moment. I I really really don't. I'm forever grateful that um, that even and and the age thing as well. You know that I'm I'm still <laughs> getting cast, and you know Listen. I'm not in my thirties anymore. Listen, I think you know that there's a whole swathe of women's lives that we haven't seen stories about very many stories about and that was one of the things that we really loved I think all of us about ordinary love is that we got to see this really vibrant love story even through dark yeah between and that stories. is huge credit to Owen's writing and yours and Glenn's directing that you 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 told a story about a sexual relationship of two middle-aged people which you don't often see not least of all you know, a woman who's not got any hair uh, and has been through chemo, that her husband still sees a beauty in her and still wants to have sex with her. And there were so many women that I spoke to who'd been through that chemo and cancer and come out the other side. So many of them said to me they found that film that uh, uplifting, they found it positive because they were not being portrayed as women who had lost a complete sense of themselves because their hair had gone and they were probably got thin and that the film was was showing all the horrors but all the 
the positives that you can cling on to uh, if you're lucky enough to be in a relationship with somebody who still loves you, this long lasting relationship that's endured all sorts of emotional um, upheavals, but the togetherness of it and the inter intimacy of them was incredibly moving. And um, I, I think those scenes in Ordinary Love are just beautifully told and extraordinary. And somebody, somebody I'm working with now, a young man who's in his 30s that I'm working with now on Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, he watched it the other day. And what he said about Ordinary Love as a young man watching a film that's a challenge and about a generation that he is yet to fully understand, he found the film beautiful and uplifting and he said the scene when Lee, when um, Tom shaves Joan's head, he said the fact that that scene had humor in it, he thought that was remarkable, that in that most devastating and defeminizing or what could be defeminizing of moments was handled with this delicate, beautiful humor between the two of them. And he said that to him spoke volumes about that marriage and that relationship. And he said, isn't this brilliant? Well, he is a brilliant young man. He said that film gave him hope. Oh, Leslie, that's just, I'm, that's I'm, oh. And that's a young man, gave him hope. And I didn't want to say about what, your future, your, your time when you're gonna be in your 50s or 60s, what do, or, or does it give you hope for the, somebody, uh, for if, if he is ever in a situation where his, his um, mortality is threatened or he's in a dangerous situation or his parents, I didn't ask. The statement in itself was no. was clear. It gave him hope. So what a what a what a brilliant film we made, Lisa. Oh, yes, Thank you. It was wonderful to do it with you. It really was. I mean, do you want to stand or sit? When have you ever seen anyone getting their hair cut standing up? Scissors in the sense. Any particular style today, <laughs> madam? <laughs> beehive. Showing your age there, kid. A beehive it is. Before we go, uh, talking of hope, uh, you have done 
some work with the uh, Equities Benevolent Fund I know recently, and I'm just thinking about the young actors, all the professionals in film, and I know a lot of young actors and people who work in, in film and theatre will be watching this, and I just wondered in these tough times, is there anything, is there any advice you would give or any thoughts that you would like to share? It's such a difficult time for people now when- Yeah, you know, horrendous time. Yeah. Horrendous time. And I think if you're young and just starting out on your journey as an actor or a filmmaker or anything in our industry, it must be really hard to get up in the morning and put one foot in front of the other with any optimism. But you've got to hang on to that because there, there we are, there is going to be another side to this. We are going to come out the other side. We will have a vaccine. So don't, don't give up. If you can do anything, anything you need to do now, jobs wise, to earn money, to keep yourself buoyant, keep privately, keep watching films, keep watching television that you think will be valuable to watch, watch as much theater online or which isn't ideal I know, it's not how theater should be watched. Just soak up, absorb, do retrospectives. If you think, do you know what? I'd love to just do a retrospective of um, uh, Scorsese's work or Lisa and Glenn's work, just do it. Keep, keep your foot dipped in the water, do all the other things that you need to do to keep alive and hang on because it will end and we will be out the other side and we will need all of the young people now that have just come out of drama school just starting uh, we will need you like we do every year we need that we need the new blood and the new blood that i work with i'm so moved and um in awe of you, really. I th there is a brilliant stream of young filmmakers and uh, actors coming through now, bright, intelligent, uh, savvy, knowledgeable. Just don't do everything within your powers to hang on and just wait, because it is gonna shift and there'll be, there'll be space for you in the future, there will be. Well, Leslie, uh, I mean, as we said before, people are going to need those stories that we're all telling. Thank you for telling them so brilliantly. And thank you so much for chatting with me today. It was oh, well, Lisa, you know, I mean, not only do I revere you, but you're a friend. So it's always nice to talk to you. And thank you for being such a good um, interviewer. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And um, all the very best with the rest of uh, your filming in Budapest and hope to see you. Thank you. Much love. Much love.